Welcome to the Dr. Lexi Show, where I take pregnancy topics and break them down into simple terms to help you advocate for a happy and healthy pregnancy. I'm Dr. Lexi, a board-certified OBGYN and maternal fetal medicine specialist, which just means a high-risk pregnancy doctor. And today, we are visiting with a wonderful, wonderful guest, Amber Enright. Amber, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. You're so welcome. And I want to start, as everybody knows out there, please tell me a little bit about yourself and what you do. Well, I'm five foot four. Yes. <laughs> I have an I Australian have, shepherd. <laughs> <laughs> I have um, long hair. Yeah, I have long red yes. hair. Um, so yeah, I am a doctor of physical therapy. And what that means is I am a musculoskeletal expert. I love that. Yeah. So basically how your body connects itself and moves, that's what I specialize in. And beyond that, I own a practice here in Phoenix, Paradise mm-hmm. Valley, Scottsdale is where I primarily treat. Yep. It's called the therapy doctor. And I primarily treat not just, you know, back pain and knee pain, but I specialize in neurology yep. and oncology. I also treat geriatrics and yep. orthopedics. So a lot of people only think of physical therapy as, you know, like, oh, I had a shoulder replacement or a yeah. total knee replacement. We actually can do a lot more than that. And I'm excited to tell more about just the it. variety of stuff we do. I love it. So Amber has no idea that I'm going to throw questions at her right now. <laughs> Excellent. I'm I ready. know. <laughs> <laughs> I had this like random <laughs> questions to start with before we dive deeper into everything. And also, we're going to have to talk about this first once we finish some of these questions. I want the listeners to understand what a doctor of physical therapy is and what like getting a getting a doctorate. Did I say that right? Yes. Is that the right? Okay. Correct. I just want people to understand not all physical therapists are necessarily created equal, just like yes. not all physicians are created equal mm-hmm. and there's different training that people do. And I, I being in the medical field, I'm like, I should know more about this. Mm-hmm. So we're going to definitely dive into that. And before we do, we're going to go into 10 questions kind of surrounding pregnancy because Every guest, I kind of like to see what people do and don't know, uh-huh. right? So we're going to just 10 random questions. Okay, fun. I'm and she, she verified too, you have no idea what these questions are going to be. I've never seen these questions before. Never. Right hand up. Whichever <laughs> hand never seen this is. <laughs> I don't have anything <laughs> for you to put the other one okay. on today. Okay, question number one. What does the abbreviation OBGYN stand for? Obstetrics and gynecology. God, you're so good. Oh, sweet. Yes. I got it. Yes. Okay. Yes. yes. All right. One down. One down. (laughs) Nine to go. Question number two. What does MFM stand for? Maternal fetal medicine doctor or specialist. Yes. Specialization. Yes. Okay. I knew that one. I did look you up, you know, like the first time we met, you said that and I was like, oh yeah, okay. I should know this. That's okay. And now you know this, right? (laughs) You have learned something. Locked in. Locked and loaded. All right. How does a provider come up with a due date during pregnancy? Okay. So I think the first due date is actually based upon the timeline that you state from conception, the time that you think that you conceived or missed your period. Mm -hmm. However, as you go, it's actually based on fetal size as they image is my second understanding. And so that your due date can change as you go. I love it. It possibly can. Okay. And I've done a YouTube on just this. What Ooh. is my due date? Uh-huh. And there's a download within it too. And you can go and get this beautiful handout that goes step by step, which is like step one. What's the first day of my last menstrual period? Uh-huh. Step two, the, someone should do an ultrasound. And then step three, <laughs> I mean, I try qualified, to, a qualified yes. professional. <laughs> <laughs> I try to, I know. And these things, they can be so confusing. So I try to like, you know, one, two, three, like break it down. Uh-huh. Simple terms as best we can. And then step three is, If the period due date and the ultrasound due date are within this many days, then you keep the period date. If they're not, you go with the ultrasound date. And it changes as the pregnancy progresses. So the further along you are, you can have more variability between those two due dates and still accept the initial due date. I mean, (laughs) it's a guessing game. Yes. It's a little bit of a guessing game. Yes. But it's it's cool. It's Yeah. It's fascinating because you can't just say like, this is my due date. Because, like, like you said, the day you conceive, right? Uh-huh. So many people come in and say, I know this is the day I conceived. Yeah. However, <laughs> but do you know the day you ovulated to really like make this whole thing jive? And no one, not, most people don't know that. Yeah, not many women know the, the yeah. dates of ovulation, yeah. even sometimes, even in their own cycle. Yeah. It can be like, very How does in, this thing work down here? It's, it's insanity. I have it's, no idea. It's too much. <laughs> it's a lot. I've always wanted to do like a little part, and I might do this in the future called like the dating game. 
Because for me, we always think of dating like people in relationships. But for me, when when I talk to other providers in the obstetrical field, I'm like, how's the dating? And I never realized when I talk to people not in the medical field that they think of that as dating, like a person yeah, dating relationship someone. dating relationship. instead of baby yeah. dating. Baby dating, yeah. <laughs> so to me, like dating is like do dating, right? Yeah. And I that sounds so weird, do dating when I say it out loud. It's I like, like it. Do you like do it? Do dating? Yeah, I mean, do dating. maybe they're still thinking about relationships yeah. like dude. Dude, dude dating. dating. Dude dating. I like it. Both. In the future, we'll have the dating show, but it's going to be like, <laughs> what's your due date? <laughs> I like it. I yeah. think we should do okay. that uh, for most people about just life goals. Yes. Life goals. What's your due date for? And then just ask oh. a random something. I like this idea. Well, we do that actually as healthcare <gasps> providers, right? Because your patient comes in and you want to get something accomplished. That's their whole goals. They're coming in for something specific. Yeah. And hopefully that goal has an actual end date. Yeah. Like, I'd like to feel better by then. Yeah. Yeah. It's your check mark. I'd like Plus, to have this baby by yeah, then. By then. <laughs> and I do like too, and I the thing with pregnancy is it it always ends, right? Like you're not gonna be pregnant forever. Mm-hmm. It's going to end at some point. So this due date kind of gives you this like the light at the end of the tunnel, right? Like down the road. The further along you get. <laughs> I'm sure that's how you, you feel. That brings us into question number four. When is a pregnancy considered term? <sighs> Term means like the baby is cooked. She can come out yeah. and be Yeah, you could say not that, require yeah. like special treatment. We we like term that's a good way to phrase it. We like term to say we think at that gestational age that the lungs are mature enough to not need a lot support. of respiratory support after delivery. Okay. I think that the I think that the answer for that is 32 weeks. But I think most people think of term as 36 weeks. So term is going to be 37 weeks. Ah. Your due date is when you're 40 weeks. Yes. And then there's all these terms surrounding the <laughs> word term. Like if you're 37 to 38 weeks, you're early term. Your term, but you're early term. And then the, the further along you get, you're like full term. So 37 is like, it's okay. Everything's good after this date. We don't need... You hope everything's okay, right? Worried. Yeah. Because, you know, the due dating that we do at the beginning is never perfect. It's it's your EDD, your estimated due date. Okay. Right? Like, yeah, it's the time when we say we think that from all the stuff we've done from your period and the ultrasound, you will be 40 weeks, which is full term, mm-hmm. on a certain date. And then when you're 37 weeks, you're considered early term. So if you needed to deliver, the baby should do well after delivery. Okay. Right? Yeah. So hospitals don't really go about delivering people at 37 weeks, like inducing, right? And like making someone go into labor because you still have that variability. What if your due date was off by a couple of days, even up to a week, then the baby could actually be more like the 36th week and then might need some respiratory support after delivery. Okay. So that's why like, we like the 40 week mark for certain people unless you're a high enough risk where we say, hey, maybe we do 39 weeks. Mm -hmm. And then if you're higher risk, like the high blood pressure stuff, then 37 weeks is when we have you deliver. There's so many changes, but knowing that due date early on helps because as a pregnancy progresses, then the doctors can say, hey, we know your due date's good. So if if we have you deliver at this many weeks, 36, 37, 38, 39, 40, whatever, we know that you're dated well Uh enough that we can hopefully say baby should do well after delivery. Perfect. Yeah. That's the goal. That's the goal. That's the goal of all of this is to have a healthy baby. All right. Question number five. What is a normal fetal heart rate? 120 to 160. God, you're good. Technically 110 to 160, but a lot of people really kind of go 120 to 160. It just makes them have warm fuzzies and stuff. Yeah. Get in on that range. A little hummingbird heart rate. I know. It's really fast. Really fast. Question number six, what is antenatal testing? And sometimes it's called fetal well-being testing. Have you ever heard of that? Uh, Is that, so that would be, is that like the APGAR scores and everything that happens after delivery? It's something usually done in like the third trimester if someone's at a high enough risk for stillbirth, where they like monitor, you know, like put the belts around somebody sometimes. So it doesn't include a needle at all? No, no needles. Thank goodness. No needles. That's not my jam. I'm like, no. no, please don't ever, no. And those needles for like an amniocentesis, they are not short. Yeah. They're, they're long. Ugh. They're long. Ugh. That's not my favorite. Needles are not, <laughs> no. No. When I knew I had to work in the hospital, I was like, I'm not. No. No, I'm going to have to do like, I did a bunch of documentaries that included them so I wouldn't like feel really terrible. No. 
or like make people feel terrible when I was in the room. Mm -hmm. I used to have like the crying <laughs> sensation. Can you imagine somebody trying to poke me in the belly with a needle? No. No. No, no I'm ready to fight you. <laughs> <laughs> My baby's in there. I never really liked poking people. Like I used to actually be a phlebotomist for a while before I went to what? medical school. Yes. And the well, doctor- Why did you, you know, do that job then? <laughs> well, okay. So here's what's I, tangential. Here we go. When I graduated from high school, sorry, college, I moved to Costa Rica okay. for a while. And I knew I wanted to go to medical school. And I'm like, I was going to go do this work at a, the University of San Jose in the Department of Nutrition. And I was going to do some research and all this stuff. And while I was down there, September 11th happened. So when I came back, everybody's like, you can't get a job. The economy, like I, but I wasn't living in the U.S. for months. So I had no idea. I mean, I didn't learn about the Twin Towers until I was sitting in like a mall in the middle of, of, of San Jose. And I look up at the TV because I didn't, the internet was like still dial up back then. Mm. This is in 2001, right? Mm -hmm. And I didn't have a cell phone back mm -hmm. then. So I couldn't reach my family. And I'm sitting in the mall eating Dos Por Uno. That's what the pizza place was called there. Okay. So two for one. Uh -huh. Every time you order one piece, you get another. I'm like, that's, that's my favorite way to eat. Gluttonous. Most anything. So good. <laughs> They also put mayonnaise on their French fries there. No, I'm and not their a fried chicken. Person. They love Kentucky Fried Chicken. They did back then, at least. <laughs> I mean, either I'm not a mayonnaise person. So I look up at the TVs while I'm eating my like Dos Por Uno in the middle of the mall or whatever, and I'm like, "What? What is that?" The first time I saw it, so it mm -hmm. had been hours because I didn't have a cell phone, and I didn't have the internet at the house I was in the house of which I was living. And then the job I went to, the internet wasn't working that day. Oh my and gosh. I didn't know why. And anyway, so that was kind of how I found out. But when I was there and then came back, everybody's like, you got to find a job as quick as you can. So I worked for an allergist and immunologist as a medical assistant. And oh. I was fresh out of college. Mm -hmm. Now you have to go to like a training to be a medical assistant. Mm -hmm. Back then it was just like, I, I have a degree in nutritional science, like molecular nutritional science and a minor in Spanish, and I couldn't find a job because I wanted to take some time off before medical school. Mm -hmm. And so I took this job as a medical assistant making minimum wage, which at the time was like $7.50 an hour, $7.50 yeah. after going through four years of college mm -hmm. and having a major and then a minor in Spanish, right? That has, I mean, well, we can talk <laughs> about money. It was like, I've, I've, I've always felt the same exact way. I mean, yeah, I took every job I could, babysitting, mm -hmm. uh Anything. I threw newspapers with my brother. No way. Were you on a bicycle? Uh, uh, yeah, a bicycle, rollerblades, whatever we, whatever was available. <laughs> Skateboard. Yeah, uh, I don't do so well on skateboards. I feel like you. I can't. No, no. just I'm straight down. Just. I. Like, that's a sacral injury waiting to happen. It is. <laughs> I'm not clumsy, but I just like, I think from gymnastics when I was younger, my ankles are so shot uh -huh. that like, that's just, I can't do it. I can't do it. So you yeah. got into phlebotomy from so, MA? Yeah. So as an MA, they were like, it was just a catch-all. So they were like, you're going to draw blood. I'm like, okay, just teach me how. Uh -huh. And they actually saw a lot of kids. And so I uh -huh. had to draw blood from children. It's very sad. Yeah. I mean, it's just not sad, but it's, they're tiny and they're they don't like to be poked clearly. That was so, my first experience. I'm pretty sure oh, that's why it's there you not go. my favorite. There you go. I'm pretty sure they were holding me yeah. down. I'm like, this yeah. is terrible. <laughs> it's it's not cool. And back then we really didn't have good butterfly needles. We were just using yeah. the really big ones. And so you had to aspirate and do all, you know, it wasn't a vacutainer. They didn't have vacutainers. So which makes the it, whole process easier. Yeah. And then yes. it's, it's it's like more flexible, right? Yeah. Okay. You put the needle in now. and you just then you don't have to do anything, right? Mm -hmm. You just let the blood come out once you like activate this vacutainer thing so it sucks the blood out. I had to put the needle in and then pull it out myself, with, which requires two hands or like, you know, it yeah, was or just some angling ang with yes. somebody that's like moving around. Yes, it was does not want that challenging. Mm -hmm. So I did that there and they also needed someone to do RAST testing. And I went to Kalamazoo, Michigan and learned how to run this huge machine and raster like they draw your blood and check for allergies and stuff. Okay. And then I also had to learn how to do allergy testing where you poke the people. Have you ever had that done where they poke your back? Or? I have not. No. I only have one allergy that I know about. So yeah. I really haven't felt that I needed that. Yeah. But I know most people have now. I feel like yeah. everybody's had an allergy test. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I, I eat yeah. everything. That's good. That's good. That's I'm probably lucky. why you're not allergic to anything, huh? You just eat Possibly. it all. <laughs> I even eat the thing that I'm allergic to sometimes. Well, I just suffer the consequence. Okay. Just a little bit. 
Another well, conversation. <laughs> another conversation. Another conversation. And then the other thing that I did as a medical assistant, I did pulmonary function testing. Oh, yeah. And then I also did, this is going to sound like the grossest thing ever. I had to get patients, I took in saran wrap and I had to get them to blow their nose into saran wrap. Ugh. It gets grosser. Okay. Grosser, more gross. It gets nastier, whatever. It gets ickier. <laughs> Nasty. Nasty. Taking, I had to then take that snot, there's no better way to say it, smear it on a slide. Uh huh. Heat fix the slide. Ew. Which is like burning you snot. Quiggers. I cook yeah. quiggers. And then you stain it. And then I had to look under a microscope. Okay. This process is so long. This is like the sexiest job on the planet. I'm Isn't it sure. though? <laughs> Isn't it though? And there's something called a manual diff, like a manual, manual differential. And they do it differently now, but back in the day, you would put it on a slide and you have to count the number of whatever you're trying to see. And you actually click on this little thing to say how much you saw. Uh-huh. So on the nasal smears, right? I would just estimate and say, hey, there's about 90% eosinophils or there's 20% or whatever. And I'd write it down for this doctor. Yeah. And then he would knows, oh, whatever they're having going on is allergic or something else. Wow, they used to kind do that cool. with snot. No, yeah, I used to do that with snot. And actually, I had to do it with blood. I had to get blood from people. And then instead of, I had to centrifuge the stuff down. Mm-hmm. And I also had to put the blood on a little slide where it had a grid. And then I would manually count, manually count the number of certain cells that were in each part of the grid. And you literally kind of get used to saying, okay, lymphocyte, eosinophil, uh, like polymor- a keyboard, like, like each button yeah, has a different yes. representation. You okay. know which finger is supposed to hit whatever. Uh-huh. And then when you get to 100, the machine goes ding, and then you stop counting. And then you look at the machine and you're like, okay, that's this many per 100. So you know you hit 100. Mm-hmm. And that's how you do a manual diff on a blood schmear or on, on blood that you put in it. It's not really a schmear for that one. But so if you're ever in a hospital and you get something and you read your CBC and it says manual diff, there's probably someone, or maybe it's a and computer now that was sitting there counting all your, because wow. it's manual diff and manual means like a manual car. Right. You're doing it yourself. Right. Right. So. See, I could be the so, person that ran the sort of centrifuge. Yeah. Like that, that part I could, you know, just pour some stuff in here yeah. and then spin it. No needles. I like that job. No needles. It was a fun job. I like it. I liked it. It's an older job. All right, let's see. We are on question number seven. How does an ultrasound estimate the weight of a fetus? Mm. Mm. That's an interesting question. So is it based on size? And I don't think it would be opacity. So it must just be size-based. So they measure parts. Yeah. uh, Like the head. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Head, arm, leg, belly. They uh-huh. measure those and put it into a computer. It spits out a weight. Okay. Yeah? yeah? Yeah. That's good. Very good. All right. Question number eight. This is a good one. What makes up amniotic fluid? <sighs> okay. Well, I know it has to be glucose because when it comes out, it smells sweet, right? When people sack breaks or is that... I will just say... They break their water? I've had a bag of water break and go down my entire head. <clears throat> Oh, oh, yeah. It, it was you were a, in a bad spot. I was in a, the worst I was in a bad spot. It was like a C-section, and somehow the fluid kind of like went up like oh. a geyser and just came down. And I will tell you, it burns your eyes, um, and it does taste a little salty. <laughs> okay. It's actually more probably, there. there is glucose that's in and it. And proteins. There's all things water. in it. But where does it come from? That's the question. Like, not what, oh. what's, sorry. So what how does it, it get produced? How does it well, get made? the mother's body makes it, but it must... I mean, it's pulling everything from you. It's baby pee. Shut up. 100%. That's why it's pretty salty. From the very beginning? Yeah. They just start Well, peeing. I mean, like the, when the kidneys form. So in the beginning, you get a little bit that's coming from other places. Baby but pee. Baby pee. Yeah. What? Yeah. So it tells us how the kidneys are working, actually. So if, if you have enough fluid, I know your baby is peeing. If you don't have good fluid, maybe your baby's not peeing. So that's why like after your water breaks— Mm-hmm. Like every hour you can still, you're still creating, but it's really the baby is it's still metabolizing. Yeah, yeah, okay. Correct. 
So when people's water breaks and they still have it's not that you're saving from, your baby. Your baby is doing its own duties. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, the baby is peeing. Oh, it's that's just a good sign. It, isn't that cool though? That'd like, be reassuring. Yeah. Like so, I can't get to the hospital yeah. right away or whatever, and okay. I don't even know this, but I'm leaking. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But my baby is still doing the work. Yep. Okay. Yep. Good. So like when we do an amniocentesis, like we were talking about the needle yeah. and put it in there, we can send it off. And we do look at the amount of glucose that's in there. We look at the amount of all these other things to look for whatever we're looking for, right? You can Uh send it for genetics. You can send it for infectious concerns, things like that. Question number nine, who should be offered Down syndrome screening in a pregnancy? High risk. Okay. I think the answer would be people with family history, possibly. Um, Also high risk women. And then maybe advanced paternal age as well. Okay, so this is a great thing to learn. Yeah, I don't know. Everybody. Oh. Everybody should be offered it. Yeah. And okay. this is one of the main reasons why all those things that you said, minus advanced paternal age, not as much associated, but advanced maternal age okay. is associated with an increased risk of Down syndrome because we don't have as many eggs when we get older. And so the eggs we have left, you don't have as many to, to choose from, right? When you ovulate, there's just not as many there. It's not because the eggs themselves are bad like chromosomally... They Age. could they could be. Okay. I mean, like they there's so many things that go into that, but when you have less of the eggs, the quality of the eggs also might not be as good too. Okay. So that's a possibility. Almost all Down syndrome is random sporadic, meaning it happens when the egg and sperm are meeting and they're going through all the changes to then make a little And it's just a DNA chromosomal A typical abnormality. I tell people it's a, a hiccup. Yeah, it's a hiccup okay. that happened sometime when egg and sperm met. And they started doing their cellular turnover to start making this early fetus. But you find that out really early. Well, like at the end of the first trimester, you can find that out. Yeah, you can get a blood test as Mm -hmm. early as, I typically tell people, 10 weeks. Mm -hmm. You can do it nine weeks, but you might not have enough. You might have to repeat the test. And that test also is evaluating for the gender. And so a lot of people call it the gender test. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's early because you can't really tell the gender on an ultrasound until about 14 weeks. Um, But yeah, everyone should be offered Down syndrome screening, regardless of age. The last question, question number 10. This is the longest test since my blood certification. I know. What is considered a normal length of a cervix in pregnancy? Oh, geez. I know that's a hard one. Length? Length. In pregnancy. Yeah. And this changes over time, right? It does. It gets thinner and wider. It does. So this is kind of, I don't want to say it's a trick question. And I thought about this after I wrote it in such a vague fashion, but... When individuals are around that 20-week mark, okay, they should all have the length of their cervix checked. So to be more specific, when you're 20 weeks pregnant, how long should a cervix be? I'm just going to say two inches. Oh my God, now you're Sounds in inches like and lot. I say it in centimeters. It, uh, <laughs> okay, two, so. 2.5 centimeters, which is An less inch. than two inches. Okay. So it, like, yeah, around an inch-ish. Okay. Inch-ish? Yeah. yeah. Um, we like it to be above three centimeters, but if it's below 2.5, that's too short for our liking. And then if it's too short, there's an increased concern that preterm labor could happen and ultimately a preterm delivery. Because it widens and thins as you go. In labor, it does. In labor, it, it does. It shouldn't so really do those. happening too early is the problem. Correct. Okay. It usually shortens, like for labor, it'll it'll shorten and then it starts to open some. And those two things, it's not like one happens and then the other. They can right. happen um, continuously or simultaneously, I guess you could say. You passed. There is no pass or fail, so you pass regardless, okay, but excellent. you did great. Yes. We have now, these are just rapid fire questions. Okay. They're all just true, false now. Okay. Ten of them. True or false? A fetus can have hair in the womb. True. Question two, a fetus can hear. True. Question three, if a pregnant individual eats sugar, they will wake a fetus up if the fetus is sleepy. They're going to increase the metabolism. I don't know if it's going to wake them up. But I do know know that if they have sugar, that like you're more likely to feel kicks and movement. So maybe they are waking up. And this is the... Or I read that. It was like the kick test. Yeah, but... And this is my question. This is why I've talked to a few people. Where did... Where did you read that? Do you remember? Uh, um, I've talked a lot with guests lately about like what our sources are because... Yeah, I like to look stuff... Internet, like when but, I'm looking things up, mm-hmm. I try to look for reliable. So sometimes it's yeah. like Cleveland Clinic mm-hmm. or Mayo mm-hmm. Clinic and you're looking things up like yeah. something specific, like kick test. So yeah, whatever it is. So sugar can 
And I I had someone in the medical field, a couple of people in the medical field on recently, and everybody's kind of like, meh, with this so answer. So I don't know where I got that resource is my bottom line. I don't yeah. want to, I don't want to misspoke. Uh, most of what I have, so this is the main thing. If a baby is sleepy, anything you eat or ingest is not really going to quote unquote wake them up because they go through sleep cycles. Mm -hmm. The only thing that can really kind of make them kind of like jump a little bit is like a, an acoustic stimulation. So mm -hmm. like a vibration. Mm -hmm. So that's why when people say they put headphones on their belly and the baby moves, it has to have like probably a lot of bass, right? Mm -hmm. Or you can take like a little, we have a little vibration monitor right. thing that you put on there and it goes like this uh -huh. and it kind of tickles. And you can almost immediately, if the baby is doing okay, they'll kind of jump. Which is and move not around. something to constantly do to your belly to get your baby to move, right? No. Like add vibration no. is not really <laughs> no. key, but no. if a test is required, that's right. That's right. So we call it fetal acoustic stimulation, uh -huh. and you just kind of buzz the baby. That's what yeah. we use as a colloquial term to. Did you buzz the baby? Right. Sugar sometimes can make babies. I would say even more sleepy. So like if you have moms that are super diabetic, right, and their sugars aren't good. Sometimes you won't see the babies move as much. They kind of get sleepy. It's almost, I always think of it as like when people say I'm in a sugar coma, right? Like I ate mm -hmm. so much and now I'm just tired. Mm -hmm. And the administration of corticosteroids that women get to help try to boost the baby's lungs, is kind of a thing that people hear about. Sometimes you don't see as much reactivity on the monitor, meaning the baby's not really doing as much, you know, kicking and screaming in there and stuff like that. Because mm -hmm. the steroid obviously makes mom's blood sugar levels go up. Okay, question number four, true or false? Everyone should be screened for diabetes when pregnant. True. Question number five, true or false? Everyone should be screened for thyroid disorder when pregnant. False. Correct. That is the correct recommendation currently. Okay. <laughs> question number six, someone with two prior C-sections has to have a third C-section. False. Very good. Very good. Question number seven. Twins that are the same gender are always considered identical. False. God, you're good. <laughs> Question number eight. No cheese is safe to eat while pregnant. Oh, man. I don't like this question. I'm going to say false. Correct. Pasteurized cheeses are okay. Non-pasteurized cheeses you shouldn't eat. Yeah. I think it's the worst. I just love cheese. So... <laughs> Now, one, I have to side note this too. What's your favorite cheese? Probably goat cheese, but I also like feta. Mm. They're, they fight each other. Oh, you know what? Mm. No. Um, someone cooked me, grilled me Greek cheese oh. Cy from Cyprus. That sounds good. It was grilled and it was delicious. If you put a little drop of honey on that, oh, <sighs> that I'm a cheese person. Good. So I might be oversharing here. I like cheese. Cheese doesn't like me. So, I'm so sorry. I, I need the cheeses that aren't super gooey, like the ones that I typically would like. The Cypress one might fit you. Okay. It's it's more firm. Yes. It's a hard it's cheese. It's kind of like a feta, okay. but doesn't okay. crumble. Okay. So I have an issue with lactose. That's what that's about. And nut cheeses. I do a lot of nut cheeses. Have you had nut cheeses, like a cashew cheese? Never. Okay. We're Maybe gonna do we it. We should do an alternative yes. cheese party. Yes. Yeah. We'll do a cheese board with no actual lactose or milk cheese. And some people can't even tell. I like trying new things. Yeah. I will tell you if, if it's I can bad. Tell. Okay. <laughs> I need an honest opinion. I'll tell you if I can tell, but I'm I like trying new things. Okay. So. Good. Mm -hmm. Then we're gonna try this. It's, it's happening now. Fun. All right. Question number nine. Someone trying to get pregnant should start taking folic acid before pregnancy. A hundred percent true. Yes. Question number 10, last question here, true or false? Baby aspirin is an over-the-counter medication that can prevent a certain type of high blood pressure during pregnancy. True. Love it. You did great. Oh, thank you. Oh my God. Okay, now that we have like some of those fun questions out of the way too, I want to dive into a couple of things physical therapy related because I feel so honored to have you. Yeah, thank you. So honored. And before I ask you some questions here, I've got to, I've got to tell people a little bit about how amazing you are. So if I mess anything up, add this up, tell me. Well, flattery works, so I'm already in. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so Amber is a physical therapist, a doctor of physical therapy mm -hmm. as well. So I just say she's a PT because I like to abbreviate everything. And if you have something where you're like, oh, I think I might need a physical therapist, right? I used to think I have to. And even as a provider, I thought this is what I had to do if I needed physical therapy that I have to call my primary care doctor, get a referral, and then drive to some random place that's 40 miles from my house 
two to three days a week to get physical therapy with a new person I don't know every time. (laughs) And then they don't tell me what to do when I go home. And if they're closed, I can't go. I have to call every week for a new appointment. And then I end up paying $75, $80, $90 every time. And then I get a bill later for hundreds of dollars because now it's gone through my insurance and they denied it because it wasn't spaced Mm -hmm. out, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And then I found Amber and it was the best thing ever because I used to be a high jumper. Sometimes I throw my back out. Sometimes it's picking up a sock, which is what <laughs> happened, which is so embarrassing. Oh, yeah. I'm delicate. You I don't know how many flower. people throw their back out getting off the toilet. Okay. So yeah, mine don't wasn't be that bad. Putting okay. on a, a pair of pants. Okay. See? Like even young it's people. Hard. No, okay. yeah. See, it happens. Okay. <laughs> so then I, I learned about her and someone was like, yeah, you can basically get in touch with her. She'll come to your house. I'm like, okay, that's awesome. That's my schedule's crazy. That'll be great. She'll explain everything to you. It's cash pay. Mm -hmm. You don't have to wait for all this insurance stuff. And she'll explain to you. I'm like, why is, I feel like everyone should do this, but she'll explain to you exercises to do so you can do them at your own pace. And then she'll kind of talk to you about follow-up plan and if she thinks you need to see her again or not and how Mm -hmm. to work it. And I was like, I want to do that. And I did it. And I, in no lie, my back, I did all the right things. Plus I did the work. Like she told me what to do. I did it. I followed up with her. She followed up with me. She's like, how are you doing? I'm like, oh my God, she cares and she loves me. (laughs) And like to be a patient and feel the, feel that your provider cares is like, it's so amazing. And I, it definitely helped my healing process. And anytime my back gets anywhere close to feeling bad, I start doing the exercises. She has empowered me to be able to do those things for myself. And it just, she even helped my dad when he was, he was in town and I was like, he needs this. And I, and it was just like, we figured it out and it's the best thing. And people, I think sometimes run away from things like this because they're like, I'm talking quickly now because I get so excited. I get fired up. I love that you're talking about you (laughs) and your family because- yeah, and this it's is the whole awesome. Point. And I think people get nervous about a cash pay option. They're like, wait, that's weird. I'm paying more than I would initially pay with my insurance and it scares people off. Mm-hmm. But if I look at what I paid versus what I ultimately had paid doing all this stuff through insurance and everyone's insurance is different. You may have a great insurance plan. It Insurance is stressful, et cetera. And I deal with insurance on both sides of it. So I know how that can go. Having the peace of mind and knowing that I would have follow-up and that I could reach the physical therapist. I could reach her. Yeah. And she would communicate with me. The physical therapy places I had gone to before, they're open for certain times. I couldn't get a call back. There's someone at the front desk that's new every day. That's, you don't even know if you're actually being treated by a PT sometimes. No. So anyway, I just had to say that up front to say, I loved every bit of her care and I want everyone to know about what she does because it's amazing. And I want you to tell us a little bit more so that people understand all of that as as best you can explain it. And after that, for those listening, because most people I hope that are listening are pregnant or becoming pregnant or had a baby, I want to go into the specific things that you can do Mm -hmm. for those that are pregnant. But first, before you go there, I just, I got to let you tell some more about how you do this and the passion you have behind it, because I know you have a passion behind it and I freaking love that. Yeah, so um, I have been practicing for over 10 years now. Mm -hmm. And um, in that time, I've actually also probably worked in the most types of settings. I think that's important because a lot of people in any field, I guess, have basically worked in like one setting. They just think of like that job as like something that they can't leave. They're attached to it. I've gotten to see a plethora of options of what my field can do. And then I got to narrow it down. So into things that I truly enjoyed and I enjoy it because it's a puzzle. Yeah, I love solving puzzles. You know, that last little click, you know, mm-hmm. when you get that puzzle piece in, it yeah. feels so good. Yeah. And I love the interaction. Like I'm I love that you said, I know how to treat myself because that's actually the whole point of physical therapy. You can totally make patients dependent on your care. And yeah, but that's not your goal, right? That's like, not your goal. Yeah. That should not be your goal. To treat someone means that I'm teaching you how to treat yourself Yeah. in, in my field. So a typical PT, I, I ask people, have you ever had physical therapy before? And what was your experience? And they, okay, I went to this PT. They gave me a list of exercise. Yeah, I know what you do. 
okay, well, primarily I am, I am a manual therapist. So I primarily treat people on the table and then I educate them on the things that they should be doing on their own. So I make them responsible and accountable. And it's not like they get into trouble. Yeah. I like my patients. They're not in trouble for not doing it, but it helps me adjust their plan of care yeah. according to what their needs are, which means that I'm able to save you money if I don't have to see you three times a week because you're doing the follow-up. Now, if you have something like a joint that I need to gap to create room, to stretch you, you know, just in layman's term to help you feel better because we need to get you out of pain, mm -hmm. that could require more frequent treatments. But to blanket statement that all people need you know, two to three times a week for six to eight right. weeks is untrue. And if yeah. you did pay $80 for now 16 treatments yeah. minimum, okay, you've spent quite a bit of money. And, and usually you treat you in way less than that. Yeah, and usually they truncate the time. Like if you get to that many, say that you need that many, mm -hmm. that they tell you you need that many, insurance typically is like, yeah, you only get 10 or you only get five. Yeah, these days there's a lot more limitation on what yeah. your insurance will provide. However, your provider can can end up justifying why you need more care. So that is still your responsibility as the patient to make sure that you're approved. Right. And usually those facilities are having you sign a form that basically says, look, you're responsible for this, okay? Mm -hmm. You know you're responsible for it. And if your insurance doesn't cover it, you're actually paying more than you would pay me for a visit right. for that reimbursement because you were there for 75 minutes. Yeah. They did six different codes on you. Yeah. Mine's the same every single time I come, no matter if I need to treat your back or your shoulder or your neck. And if I'm treating multiple joints or areas in an outpatient clinic, I can only do one at a time. If you came in for your knee and you have low I back pain. I didn't know that. Yes. So huh? the script and insurance limit my ability to provide huh? your actual care. So if you came in with lumbar pain, I'm not supposed to touch your neck and your thoracic spine. Although I did, I was required to screen it. So you screen okay. above and below whatever the injury area is or the problematic area. Okay. Now in neurology, it's way more complex than that. In oncology, it's way more complex because I'm treating the system. Yeah. Okay. So maybe you get a more thorough evaluation during things like that that are more atypically thought of as physical therapy areas, but they're not. They're normal physical therapy areas. Um, and I like to say I treat from diagnosis through end of life. So what that means is if you have something that's coming up, you're going to think of me first. And yeah. just like what you said, if your provider is someone that you care about, if they made you feel cared for, you're of course going to call them first. So I have people that call me, oh, do you know a specialist in this? I am happy to refer someone over to the right person. They trust that I'm going to do that. And they yeah. trust that I'm going to say, I don't know, but let me get you to so-and-so because they are the best at this. And if you're looking for a cost-effective solution, these are the most appropriate options. Mm -hmm. If you're looking for the most personal, I I love doing that. So yeah. I don't always have the answer, but I want to try to find it. So again, the puzzle piece is a huge thing for me and, and really why I had to create my own business. Yeah, I mean, it just was not an option for me to continue to practice in the norm of the insurance-based world because yeah. I was so restricted on what I could do. And it was like, really, it was about popping a patient in, popping a patient out and getting a note done. And then I'm seeing as many as I can in a day. My job felt less satisfying for that reason. I love what I do now. I yeah. mean, I am so focused on every patient and the feedback about like, even them not just feeling better with their body, but like feeling better. They feel yeah. good because of the interaction. And I think all PTs are nice people. They're, so when I hear like, oh, my PT was the nicest, that does not buy it for me. <laughs> that's just That's just a blanket nice. statement. They're nice. Yeah, yeah. PTs are good. really nice. They're healthy. They're fit. Like I went to this... Uh, grassroots thing for the APTA, which is our national organization in DC. Mm -hmm. And a politician came in and it's a room of like 300 PTs from across the country. And he starts and he's like, oh my gosh, this is one of the most attractive room of individuals. <laughs> and I'm like, you know, they are, they're fit, yeah. they're healthy. Like they, they have a special energy because they love what they do. But we can do so much more than assign you guys exercises. And I hate that that's the only thing that people know about our profession is like, here's mm -hmm. a bunch of exercises it should be about teaching you how to take care of your body in the long term. So yeah. if you don't leave learning something that will help you also again in the future. And so if it's not working in the future, what the, what we assigned you, you call me back in and we give you what's new. Yeah. Things could have changed between then and, and now. Yeah. Um, so I love that you said that. And the trust piece is an important piece. So being able to be referred to your father, mm -hmm. thank you, or your family members, that is that speaks volume. So thank you so much for that, um, for your trust. 
in my care, but hopefully that's the experience that people are having when they go in and see someone. Yeah. And yes, there's a lot of different specialty areas people don't know about. So there's like uh, people who primarily work in like the neuro ICU, the mm-hmm. CVICU for like heart transplants. And then there's cardiac rehab. Um, cardiac nurses and cardiac PTs can work in those settings. There's wound care PTs. So I worked in a hospital where PTs did the wound care and I was a wound care person. She's um, done it all basically, guys. Yeah, I've done it all <laughs> except professional sports, which of course I've treated pro athletes, but they're not really supposed to see outside people. So, yeah. you know, it's a thing where a lot of people will choose to get something um, and I want to be that provider. But if there's someone better to see, I'm going to refer them She'll to let that. you know. Exactly. So then let's jump then in into pregnant individuals mm-hmm. because from my standpoint, I feel like individuals, when they become pregnant, they're told by someone or maybe the internet, you can't see your physical therapist anymore or you can't go see a physical therapist. So I guess for people mm-hmm. who have been seeing a physical therapist for something like low back pain, mm-hmm. from your wonderful PT brain, tell me, are you okay with them? I'm okay with them coming yes. to see a physical therapist if they know what they're doing. Yes. Right. Okay. With so, someone that's pregnant. Yeah. Pregnancy is not some great anomaly. Okay. It's a normal process. It's like, you know, I don't like that people are ashamed to talk about their period. <laughs> uh, I mean, I don't need to talk about it every day, but it's just like pregnancy is normal. It's not some like huge aberrant thing. Uh, it's not outer space. It's not something that needs to be overly explained. So a generally a good physical therapist should know what they're doing with a pregnant individual. And you just have to think about the basic mechanisms of anything that's starting to stretch. And, mm-hmm. and a lot of people with back pain, that's their primary issue is laxity. Their, their ligaments are becoming looser to prepare for delivery over the course of pregnancy. If you already have injury in your spine, that's something that we have to consider. So your primary PT is probably pretty adept at seeing you, okay? So if you have somebody that you're like, I really trust what they're saying, ask them straight up and they should give you a straight up answer for if they're the perfect person to see in the clinic. Now, that being said, there is probably no reason why a physician should tell someone that because of pregnancy that they're inappropriate to have physical therapy. In fact, I would, I would, I would, I guess quite the opposite. If you've already had back pain, you're probably more likely to experience back pain during pregnancy. Um, it's just sure. part of the stress. And even if you had never had back pain before, you probably will experience it over the course of pregnancy. It's very normal too. Um, you can experience other kinds of pain as well. So we're talking about the difference between an incident or a time of day when you're hurting the most or an activity when you're hurting the most and being aware of that versus I'm having atypically chronic pain during pregnancy. Mm -hmm. So if we're just talking about during pregnancy, there's a lot of things that you can just generally do to help your body. So if we're talking about something that's overly stretched, a lot of things that that are overly lax, they require some stability, right? So if I have something that wiggles too much, you know, I'm going to basically pin it down. So during pregnancy, if you're having pain, one of the first things that you can generally try is just an SI belt You can buy them online. It's like a four-inch wide Velcro belt, generally speaking, and you cinch down your pelvis. And you're not going over your belly Where does it go? It goes like below, right? Yes. So it literally, if you can feel where your tailbone is, and you can feel those bones that make up your hips, like the big wings of your pelvis, Mm -hmm. you're going to go between that and the ball of your hip. So that outside pointy Mm -hmm. part. So when you sit down, it should basically be um, in the crease of your hip joint. Yeah. Okay, so as low as you can get it basically and still sit down. And it's called an SI belt? SI, it means sacroiliac. And so basically it's the the point where your sacrum, that tailbone that kind of sticks out at the end of your your spine and the wings of your pelvis, they start to basically kind of get loose and widen during pregnancy. This is normal. This is normal. Your body changes, your rib cage changes, everything kind of expands laterally and forward. Mm -hmm. Um, And so what's happening there is the the... All of the ligaments in the pelvis, uh, the pubic symphysis, the SI joints, all your ligaments are gradually and progressively just stretching out. They're preparing for childbirth, the most natural thing for a woman's body to be able to do. If it's causing you pain, you can cinch it down for periods where you're having pain. So usually those are like standing, I'm vacuuming for a while, I'm doing the dishes. So if you're if you're sitting for long periods and that's not causing you pain, you don't have to wear it during that time. Yeah. So wear it during the times when you know you're going to expect to have discomfort. Um, you can buy them online, right? Is that what you, you said? You can literally like, yeah. buy them on Amazon. So an SI belt and a sacroiliac belt. 
Then, of course, a belly band, which most people have heard of. And there's different kinds. There's one that's kind of like a jock strap. <laughs> and oh. so it's a tighter Velcro form. Okay. Um, and it looks just like an SI belt, but it also has like two elastic bands. Uh, some of those are also designed for like pelvic prolapse. So if you're if you have pelvic prolapse prior to pregnancy mm-hmm. or something that's anatomically different in your pelvic floor, pelvic floor weakness, incontinence, something like that, that would be more likely the time that I would automatically go and see a women's health specialist that has experience with pregnant women. So that's a specialty inside of physical therapy, pelvic floor specialists or women's health specialists. So they have extra education and specialty in just the muscles that make up your pelvic floor Mm -hmm. and that are, that are changing and holding your baby up too, as well as your bladder function, um, which a lot of women have incontinence as your baby starts to grow in the second and third trimesters that becomes a little bit more apparent, you know, um, all this stuff down there. There's so much stuff down there. Yeah. And so if, and if you don't know about pelvic floor strength, that's a really important component. A lot of people don't understand that their abdomen, their diaphragm and their pelvic floor are all points of stability that pull on the spine. Mm -hmm. So the spine is like the foundation. The foundation is the floor and the abdomen helps, uh, the, the abdomen is what it pulls on or what pulls on it. So as the belly expands and the abdomen is moving or distending away, it's kind of like I'm holding a gallon of milk on a straight arm way out here. And so the leverage of the force, even though a gallon of milk is only 8.8 pounds or some 7.8 pounds. It's that heavy? Oh my God, I didn't know that. Yeah, it's well, it's less than your head weighs and it's less oh. than, it's about the, you know, full expecting weight of a baby. I was right? about to say, it's kind of like here. about the, yeah. Okay. So if I leverage it out, Anywhere away from my body, the increased force yeah. and that leverage is maximally full. Yeah. You know, it's like tenfold out here. So I can't hold it up as long. So you need to be thinking about that. But one of the things that you can do is strengthen your pelvic floor and mm-hmm. your abdomen prior to pregnancy and during pregnancy. So pregnancy, again, it is generally safe unless you have some kind of very, very atypical uh, finding from your physician that yeah. you absolutely should not be exercising. And those would be extreme risk factors, correct? Sure, sure, yeah. Um, but generally speaking, to strengthen your abdomen and your pelvic floor during pregnancy would be perfectly appropriate. And there are actually not just specialists, but you can find programs online that are, there's there's a lady actually, the vaginawhisperer.com. Oh, that's her. That. Yeah, so she just does women's health, pelvic floor. And if you want to buy the whole thing, it's like $250, but it's an online program that walks you through like the beginning stages of pregnancy, or even if you want to do pre-pregnancy stuff mm-hmm. and post postpartum, like all of that, it, it there's exercises you can do that help make sure that your continence is managed, mm-hmm. that you have appropriate strength, and that's that's not just for pushing the baby out. Yeah, it's for uh, for everything, for everything, <laughs> all of your uh, bowel and bladder functions, as well as being strong enough to be able to manage your body better post-delivery. Yeah. Because I think that you touched on the kind of low back pain, which is a lot of, would you say most low back pain in pregnancy is SI related or not necessarily? It's just laxity related. Laxity related. It's basically the stretching of the ligaments and it's just laxity related. Or you're, or like if you carry high and tight, you might feel a little bit more like my muscles are stretching, 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 or you have multiples. Got it. It's like growing pains. Yeah, yeah. So are there str- are there stretches that can be done for that kind of discomfort too? Because I always hear mm-hmm. people say, oh, I have low back pain, so I, I've got to lay in bed all day. And I'm like, no. that is, I that's the worst thing mm-hmm. to do. Yeah. So, and, and generally speaking with back pain, that's absolutely the worst thing to do. If you can imagine any time when you were sick and you spent two or three days in bed, or even a day in bed, and you get up and you're so incredibly sore, you yeah. made it worse. So I think of joints as like this, it's, it's a closed space. Every joint is basically this closed space. And when something happens, trauma happens, or anything atypical where we're having overstretch, or we have injury and inflammation, um, any of those things that changes how they sit, how they function, or the space that they live in, uh, they become irritable yeah. and we need to move them to make them feel better. And it's kind of like if a, if a sponge sits on the counter and it's dirty, it starts to stink. Mm. We have to wring it out all the way and then absorb new water into it to like get the bacteria and everything that's growing in there out and bring in new stuff. So yeah. the joints in the body are happiest when they're able to move. 
Now, a lot of people will recommend Pilates uh, and yoga. So I think Pilates is a little bit of a safer exercise to do because it's not based on end range motions, but yoga type motions where you're moving through uh, a moderate range to mm -hmm. an almost end range position are healthy for the body. Um, I say avoid end range because as you go, again, laxity is one of the the reasons why people start to kind of have shifts, yeah. right? And then, so they're kind of sitting atypically um, and why they might be craving a little more stability like the belt or the belly band, yeah. or something to help their joints hold them up and to help yeah. their muscles be relieved from a position. So if I walk kind of bent over, like I'm pushing a cart and I do that for two hours or I'm carrying a box, of course, my body's gonna hurt in that position. And then I sit up as tall as I can. And of course, my body says, oh, wow, I appreciate that, but it didn't feel great the first time. So I do small repetitions of it. Uh -huh. And by the 10th to the 30th rep, my body actually feels way better. Yeah. So you can try that out. But a mid-range motion, even pelvic tilts while you're sitting. Yeah. Um, anything to move squats, a little bit, yeah. right? But one Movement. of the best things that I could say is if you're going to ask and you're having a lot of pain and you're pregnant and you're, you're more advanced in your pregnancy or you've gained a lot of weight during your pregnancy or you're carrying multiples, Anything that's increasing the stress of your normal positioning and normal uh, body optimal functioning, aquatic therapy is amazing. Water. Water's Get good. Get in the water. Just walk laps. I mean, we don't like um, like hit programs. You're not going to be riding a horse, generally no. speaking. You're not doing a lot of jostling motions. We're not doing a ton of calisthenics. You can do body weight workouts. You can do resisted workouts. All of that is safe. Yeah. Walking programs. Um so getting in the water obviously offers your body so much buoyancy. So the deeper that you get in the water, the more assistance that water is offering your body to take pressure off of your joints, yeah. off of your muscles, and you still get a heck of a workout. Yeah. So, I mean, literally getting in the water and moving your hips in four directions and moving your arms yeah. and rotating your trunk and trying, trying to create resistance using the water is probably one of the healthiest forms of exercise I could recommend to a woman that's not in her first trimester anymore or hasn't, uh, you know, started to advance her bump yet. Yeah. Um, if you haven't and you're interested in working out, a Pilates-based program where you're actually working your pelvic floor and your abdominal wall and working on a lot of breathing would be really, really appropriate for you. Yeah. And probably the easiest thing to describe without getting into demonstrating exercises. Right, right. Um, a lot of women don't know about their pelvic floor at all. True, that's they very true. They just know like, okay, I can have sex and there may or may not be pain, which if there's pain, that may be a reason to go see a women's health specialist, not a regular PT. If um, if you have incontinence, that might be a reason to go see, or you can't go when you want to. Mm -hmm. That's a weird one. If anybody's ever sat on the toilet and you have a trickle, but you really have to go, that may be, uh, you know, one of the muscles not being able to fire hard enough while the sphincter muscle or the one that's round and actually allows for uh, the flow of urination, basically the trap door opens, um, you may have uh, either a, an atypical relaxation and contraction mechanism, but that would maybe be a reason to go besides incontinence. Um, and then uh, not being able to hold it appropriately. Yeah. Um, and so some of that, again, happens more naturally in the bigger that your baby is or the more babies that you have, that places extra pressure on the bladder. So yes, you have to go more frequently, but um, hopefully you're able to uh, find those signs early on. So pelvic floor strength, kind of a weird thing to think about, but if you don't know that you can contract your pelvic floor, there's more than just Kegels going on down there. Yeah. So a Kegel is just a contraction of basically the sphincter type muscles, but you should also be able to kind of pull your pelvic floor up, up toward your spine, up toward your belly button, up toward your head. Um, and those muscles are uh, attached to your abdominal muscles and to your spine. And they create like a sling for your bladder and your pelvic floor and your uterus and everything else. And so um, when you're pregnant, there is also anchor points for the uterus that basically hold your baby in position. Oh, these are my favorite. Yeah. These so, are my favorite. Uh, the round ligaments. Yes, the round ligaments. They're bungee cords for your baby, yeah. right? Well, and so, yeah, they, they're, they're the uterus pinpoints. And so as your baby is growing, as your uterus is growing, you can kind of feel these growing pains. And that's probably a good way to describe them as yeah. some people have like an aching, like in their groin line up to the side of their belly, but primarily in their groin line. Um, and, and it's likely the round ligament. That's, it's likely the round ligament. Because the tugging, you get a little bit on that ligament there. Right. Now, if it's 
if it's constant pain, that's not going away. That's totally different. And you need to go to your doctor. But these are like, sometimes people will describe them when they're moving quickly. uh, And it's like a sharp pain and then it goes away. Or you laughed or coughed or sneezed and you feel it. Again, some of those contractions or quick movements can cause it. Um, Sometimes people just who, if it's like their first pregnancy, they've never experienced this kind of stretch in their abdominal wall before, um, they may need to just reposition their body. So like, so when you, okay, because I'm, round ligament pain is very common. Mm -hmm. And when I have patients with it, I always have to tell them it's not going to go away. Like it just (laughs) doesn't go away, right? It just doesn't. And it is more you notice it more when you cough, laugh, sneeze, move quickly. Mm-hmm. The question then that I try to talk to them about is being in tune with their body, number one. So mm-hmm. if it if it doesn't come and go quickly, you need to go see someone because it's probably not the round ligament. But the question I have for you is what can people do if they know they're having round ligament pain other than like not moving super quickly and then obviously right. that's what causes it. But is there something that kind of might help them to get more comfortable with it or stretch a little bit more or anything where you're having it frequently stretching is a great idea so that's where like yoga type stretching comes in so if you can put yourself into like a a long uh lunge position Mm -hmm. even with pillows under you so if you need elevation put a couple of couch pillows under you and get into like a long lunge with one leg in front and one leg stretched out behind and then start like reaching through your trunk like literally as long as you can make your body and extending your um, chest, your rib yeah. cage, and then doing even deep breathing. So you're expanding your rib cage and stretching everything out and then almost rotating to the sides. There's, and again, if you're looking for something that's- movement in there, like you mentioned, you're stretching, right? Like you're yeah. stretching. You're, you're basically having growing pains. You're having yeah, these literally. things as your baby grows, they actually are getting tighter yeah. because there's no more room to go anywhere. And the anchors are getting tighter because your uterus is growing. Yeah. So yeah, stretching might help and you'll be able to tell right away if stretching is something that's helping you. Yeah. Yeah. It, it generally you feel feels better, you feel worse, kind of, correct. right? And if you do that when you're pregnant too, do it by like a bed or a couch yeah. so that you have somewhere on the side of you, <laughs> just because your balance might be a little off because you obviously have something in the front you of you that you usually don't have. You can feel when you're pregnant. Yeah. <laughs> you can feel really off balance. Your ligaments are long and lax. Uh, so all of those things lead to like some instability and mm-hmm. actually sometimes even increased fall risk. Mm-hmm. Uh like you can have jello legs, you know, oh, for lack of a legs. better term. Like you just, you're Sea-less. tired, but it's not a reason not to move at no. all. It's a reason to move. So if you can't get in the water, some gentle stretching, mid-range motions, but for round ligament pain, groin pain, you can actually stretch your hips. You can mm-hmm. get into like the long lunge position. You can do um, like almost like a, a a child's pose into cobra. Yeah. Again, putting pillows under your body for whatever comfort position you find. It's not a bad idea to stretch. Yeah, because um, child's pose in a cobra would be a little hard with the belly. You kind of move if your you knees get out to the sides. Yeah, put pillows under your knees if you need to to create like a yes. gap. Yes. Um, so get creative with uh, propping. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can even use your pregnancy pillow if you sleep with one and yeah. kind of make it wide and go around your body and just put your put yourself in a different gravitational position. Yeah. Put yourself in a, a different gravitational position and then open a rib cage and breathe into that side. You'd be surprised oh. how much opening you can get to yeah. your rib cage by breathing into that side. And if you think of it that way, sometimes that's helpful. The breathing exercises are great. Like, like as she mentioned, putting your hands above and stretching into one side or the other too, mm-hmm. because you do have changes in your rib cage and in your diaphragm and individuals can start feeling some of those changes as early as eight to 10 weeks in their pregnancy. A hundred percent. So starting early on feeling that and breathing into it can really help for not having maybe as much of that sensation as sensation of shortness of breath as the baby starts to get bigger and bigger mm-hmm. and pushing and pushing because you will have, your diaphragm is going to move up and out. So yeah, you, your ribs can be literally yeah. pushing out of the way. If you're having multiples, that's probably happening in the second trimester oh, already. Early, yeah. Yeah. Um, and so your body is accommodating to fit a watermelon inside of you. <laughs> and, uh, you know, again, yes, there's things that you can do. No, that does not require a specialist, you know, just for round ligament pain. You can also just warm the tissue up. So literally, I'm not, you know, for some kinds of pain, uh, heating the tissue up just allows it to stretch a little bit. Like It makes it more pliable like most things when you heat them mm-hmm. up. And you can do that just by rubbing the sides of your belly, literally rubbing the sides or rubbing your groin line. So heat the tissue up and you're not like sitting in a hot tub. No. You're just using your hands. And it should actually warm the tissue up and make it a little more pliable. So do that before you stretch. And sometimes even just the rubbing sensation will help. 
if you're having pain when you move quickly, you can actually brace your body even with your own hands, like grab your belly and kind of hold it in if you're more advanced. If you're not, you can use a pillow. Um, but literally just kind of holding your sides can help with that. Mm -hmm. um, they say the same thing after like chest surgery, abdominal surgery, like anything where you can kind of brace in before you move mm -hmm. can help stabilize the area and then support you while you have to move quickly. So those are just general guidelines. And I guess I say those like they're common knowledge, but it's probably not. Yeah. And that's okay. Again, if you're looking for something that's more guided, there are a lot of online uh, programs, kind of like when you have your advocacy programs online, there are some that you can find. Yeah. Uh, that one in particular, the Vagina Whisper, she has a whole program. Okay. Not for round ligament pain, but she, yeah, there's a program yeah. for exercise specifically during pregnancy. And it's like 10 minutes a day. Nice. And that that's the problem, I think, is, I mean, as someone who sees patients that would say, hey, what do I do for round ligament? I always say there are things you can do. I would get on nice sites that talk about round ligament pain and stretching, mm -hmm. but that's not my wheelhouse to be yeah. able to say, here are the stretches that you can do. Here's a regimen. Here's a program. Mm -hmm. That's a whole different provider, a whole different consultation yeah. that needs to be done. And then I think for, for patients, those who are pregnant, it might be hard for their provider to know who to send them to because they might not know. Yeah. Right. Well, okay. So like, let's talk about even the rib pain, you yeah. know, like you can have your obliques attached basically from one side of your rib cage to the opposite side of your pelvis. And they make like this nice little X. Well, that holds up your baby. Right. And so they're stretching out and they're pulling, but they're pulling on the two anchor points. So if I put a yeah. rope from one end to the other and we make a little, uh, What's that called when you uh, zip line? Oh, zip line. A zip yeah, line. Yeah, yeah. So now we're hanging on a zip line. Well, that added tension to the situation. But yeah. what's it pulling on? It's stressing this tree out. So the tree is my rib cage. It's attached to my other pelvic wall. So you know, there's components there that were like, of course it's pulling here. But what can I do about it? I can stretch it. And so you know, as those are stretching or being pressed upon, they're just pulling on other other anatomy. So general PT is totally fine to go th to for. Uh, a regular pregnancy pain, like I have chronic low back pain already. Yeah. In Arizona, you have direct access. So you don't mm -hmm. have to go to a physician yeah. to see a physical therapist. So if you're having body pain, you can go to a PT first. And we're trained in red flags that mean that, oh my gosh, this is not back pain at all. Mm -hmm. This is something else. And I've screened you for that. So I think you're having something going on with your kidneys and you told me all these other things. And I'm going to refer you back to your physician with a note about that. And if I think that you need to see a specialist, I might suggest or recommend that to the physician as well. Now, is, is that different in other states? Uh, yes. Not like, every state has direct access. Oh. So uh, in Arizona, you do. And I don't know all of the states that sure. do, but I think it's probably about half the country now that does. Okay. Um, I didn't know that. Yeah. So it's huh. kind of a new thing for us as well. But the thing that supported that is the doctorate education. So not all mm -hmm. physical therapists have the doctorate level education. I see. So we have bachelor's, master's, doctorate, and PhD program PTs, uh, educated PTs. And so in our profession, the bachelor's and master's therapists, they have a lot more years of experience, generally speaking. Okay. They can go back to school and get a transitional DPT, which is like an abbreviated DPT program that doesn't go through just musculoskeletal systems, but it also teaches them about organ functions, uh, cardiovascular, like whatever it is, you know, reflexes for the spine for neuro-based stuff. Mm -hmm. So um, it, it goes through the more advanced programming and that's so that we can help be a cost-effective solution in healthcare. Yeah. That's the whole point of why a lot of subspecialties besides just your regular primary care physician are created. Mm -hmm. It's to manage cost. So, it should be a helpful benefit to you as well that yeah. it manages your cost to find the right provider sooner. And so no, for not everything is PT going to be the answer. But if you think you're having a musculoskeletal issue, then that would be appropriate. You don't have to go, if you think you have a, a torn something, you don't have to go see an orthopedic surgeon first. A lot of times you might be able to get into a PT clinic or a PT provider first, and they can tell you because we're number two after orthopedic surgeons for diagnosing all musculoskeletal injuries. And we don't have access to immediate imaging, which your right. orthopedist does or your primary care physician does. So I, I would say if you have someone that you trust or you need someone to evaluate a musculoskeletal injury or something that you think that is musculoskeletal in origin, including during pregnancy, then a PT is appropriate resource for you yeah. to seek out. And, uh, you know, if 
you know, just like with any provider, maybe you shop around a little bit. That's, there's nothing wrong with that. Just because we're mm. nice doesn't mean that <laughs> it might be your best fit. And then also when you go into, if you're going to go into an outpatient clinic, be mindful of the handoff. Yeah. Ask questions. So this is an interesting one because when physicians are making referrals, they should write something on your script that basically just says, you can just write PT, eval, and treat. And insurance likes to see how many times and how many weeks. So generally speaking, mm -hmm. to cover it all, they'll write something like two to three times a week for six to eight weeks. And you're assuming as the patient that that's covered by your insurance. That's actually your job to check, just letting you know. And your, your provider, if they accept insurance, is doing a preliminary check to make sure that you have benefits to cover some service. And then also what your copay is. Yeah. Uh, so it doesn't mean that everything gets approved, but that's generally what they're seeing. So then you write a diagnosis code like low back pain or round ligament pain or whatever it is. You can just write pregnancy pain, you, you know, and then generally we have our own codes that we're going to use as well. So um, that's how that works. If for some reason you go in and you need something, you go to an outpatient clinic, you can shop around for outpatient clinics. So if you just Google one that's closest to your house, you might find one that is basically like a, a puppy mill for patients where you see a PT for five to 10 minutes and they quote unquote treat you on the table. They ask you as many questions as they can and they get you on the table and they treat you. And then you're handed off to a PTA, which is a PT assistant. Mm -hmm. And just like providers you know, there's a lot of fluctuation in that. And then they are going through a list of 30 pre-standardized exercises with you that you probably could have done at home. Yeah. I think it's one of the things that I don't like about my profession as it, as people know it right now is, oh man, there's so much that you could do if you're an accountable patient yeah. that you don't have to be in there paying for. So I would rather go in and see my provider for the stuff that I need done and then go home and do my homework. Now, not everybody's going to do that. And they might only do it while they're supervised. But if you're paying cash, you're a responsible person and you know that your money is valuable. So you're going to do the homework that I assign you. And I'm going to give you three things that are the most important to do. Not a list of 30 of stuff that can fill your time just yeah. so that you feel like you got something. Yeah. And so takeaways so that you're not like overwhelmed as the patient going home. Exactly. Yeah. Let me focus you on the things that are going to benefit you the most. So that could be maybe a pelvic floor exercise for you today or an abdominal, stabiliz abdominal stabilization exercise to help reduce your back pain or pelvic tilts because you have a job where you sit for eight hours and you can't get out of that even though your back hurts. So yeah. we, we need to train you on, again, how to treat yourself. And I know you're in the Phoenix area. So that's obviously for anyone watching or listening for the Phoenix area, this is easily accessible for them. So tell us how they could find you or like if mm -hmm. they're listening to this, like, oh, I, I need this now. Like, where would they go? Who would they call? What do they yeah. do? Uh, aztherapydoc.com. That's okay. my website. You can find all the information about pricing, what we offer. Um, I actually feel like I explain a lot better verbally than I do on my website, but give <laughs> me a call if you want, 480-797-1403 or aztherapydoc.com. Um, also, we could maybe link some resources if yeah. you want ever um, to either the YouTube channel. Yeah, for, we'll put like, some links SI below belt. too. Yeah. Just so that we can have, things. we'll look through all this and make sure that we have tons of the links that we've talked about down below. Yes. So you can check those out there and make sure that you have those easily accessible too. Mm -hmm. And then my other question is, if someone's listening that lives in a different state, mm -hmm. right? So that obviously they're not gonna, you can't drive to their house. They live too far. <laughs> yeah. Are there things that you could still do with them or how does that work with physical therapy? Because I know with like, with medical licenses, you have to be licensed in the state the person is. Mm -hmm. Is that the same for physical therapy? Like if someone's like, hey, can we do a Zoom or something? Can we do I that? I can do a Zoom if they're primarily treated here and they like go on vacation. Okay. I've had that happen. I'm okay. still their primary provider and they have a question. Um, I prefer to treat in person and my patients do too. They're paying a lot of money for me to come in and I just like it. It's more personalized. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, you're on vacation, you're in Hawaii, you're in New Mexico, whatever. Um, yeah, I'm happy to answer those questions or do a treatment via Zoom. Now, if your care is in another state, I cannot just pick up a whole caseload for you or right. see you, but I'm happy to refer you to someone. If you need to see a specialist, a lot of times you can find those through the APTA, um, the they American Physical website. Therapy Association, okay. uh, and find a therapist. And then, um, so uh, there's specialized programs as well, but that's like a 
whole another, other thing. Whole Are there thing. people that you that you know of in other states that do something similar like this to where they're not working for a huge company? They're doing their own thing. It's very personalized one-on-one. It's becoming way more popular. So okay. I started my business in 2017 and uh, there weren't that many people doing this, right. but I can confidently say that I'm one of the only ones that does primarily neurology and oncology not just in my state, but there are not a lot of people that do what I do as a concierge practice and treat through palliative and hospice care as well. Um, So I love that about my business, but there are a lot more professionals doing this because they care about about doing it better, I think. But a lot of them also think that they're going to be good at it because they know they're a good PT, but they might not be good at the business side. So, um, you know, I actually coach brand new business owners in this because I want to advance my profession. Yeah. Like that's important to me. Yeah. I want I want them to do it for the right reasons though. Yeah. And I don't want them to just do it because they can bill more because um that's not the that's not the reason. Although I get it. Yeah. Um so I think that going to someone with a, a specialization if you're having something really specific is is definitely the right answer. But just pregnancy, you can generally see a regular physical therapist. There are also aquatic therapy specialists. What? Yeah, I know, right? I did not know that. Yeah. That is fascinating. Like that only do that. Uh, I know one in Hawaii. Uh, wow. I, you know, are there any in Arizona that you know of off the top of your head? Mm, if not, maybe I'll look into that no, and but put some info in if no, I can find I'm meaning, one. So women's health? Uh-huh. Yes. Um, and I'll give you the names and links okay. for those. Mm-hmm. Yeah, check those out below. We'll get those updated and, and have all that info because part of what we want to do is get resources to individuals. And Amber and I've talked about this before. I love Brene Brown. Yes. I think she loves Brene Brown mm-hmm. too. If ever Brene Brown hears anything that Amber <laughs> and I have done on a on a podcast, hi Brene Brown. Hi. And we We're love fans. you. We're big fans. <laughs> We're like super fans. <laughs> <laughs> we need to get buttons that say like I love yes. Brene, Brene Brown. Yes. Um, and maybe she would like this. She okay. Could come on the show. Yes. I would yeah. love that. She's in Texas. I, I mean, like that's, that's kind of where she no, it's not I've that far. There. I go there all yeah. the time. See? Yeah, mm. I've got family there. Neighbors. But my point to that was. Part of my reading a lot of Brene Brown books over the years is I learned my two core values. And I've talked about this with you before. And you take your time and it's not meant to be personal or professional. It's meant to be both of them because that is who you are. You're not just, you know, personal and then you turn it off and then you go to your profession. You are one person, right? And so mine, after looking and and deliberating and really trying to make all these decisions, were helping others and respect and the helping others, I want to be able to do in my personal and professional life. And I think, I know you do too, mm-hmm. whether that's your true core value, because you're only supposed to pick two. And that's what she talked about. <laughs> you can only pick two. And I just really love what you do. And I love what I do. And I feel like what we're doing is trying to help people, hands yeah. down. And then the second for me being respect is more about, I liked the word efficiency. That was a core value I thought I had too. And I feel like the efficiency falls under respect because Time for me is an, is something that I think is important to me and is important to the patients that we care for mm-hmm. because they might have a family. They might have a really important job and a job they like. They have things going on in their lives just like we have other patients and things going on in our lives. And so being efficient in an appointment, whether it's with a physician or your real estate agent or an architect or a lawyer, whatever it is, That's respectful to be efficient and timely because that's just part of, I don't know, I just feel like respect to someone else is important. I want to give it. I want to receive it. So Yeah, and you should have uh, that set expectation. I mean, so like when I set an eval, this is going to be a 60 to 90 minute appointment. It's dependent upon, and I tell them, uh, your ability to tell me about the history of this and some questions and how quickly we can get through that. So if you know that you have a lot to tell me, you could write those out to make it more productive. Or if you prefer to tell me in person, expect that the appointment will be a little bit longer. So I book it out that way. Set the expectations. Yes. Yes. And then I tell them already about what the the treatments will look like. In the very end, they know exactly what to expect from me. I'm not blowing smoke. I'm telling them if I can help them or not. Mm Mm-hmm who they should see if I cannot, Yeah, what the next steps are. Absolutely. Um, I mean, and again, that's, that, yes, I like yeah. the, the. I think mine are empathy mm-hmm. and trust. I love that. So, and I think that, that go, you know, the trust yeah. piece is my integrity, my yeah. honesty, my candor, yeah. uh, my personability. 
So if I walk into your house and everybody's crying and I <laughs> read can, the room, yes, read the room, Amber. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. Or if you're like, I, my son is having this terrible GI issue and it's been going on for a year. Amber, who do, I love getting those questions because it definitely means that someone trusts me. Your so, puzzle, I feel like if you were to do puzzles, since you say you like puzzles, the ones that are like 400 pieces, you're like, no, ma'am. No, no, no. Give me the thousand piece puzzle. Every right? time. Yeah. Totally. Totally. Oh, yes. And it brings me back to the whole, like when you're talking about the expectations of an appointment, it's Brene Brown again, clear as kind, unclear as unkind. Yeah. That goes, that resonates in every bit of my life. And I think in most people's lives, if you understand the expectation and there's clarity in that appointment, right? It, it's just, if if you know what to expect, you're not going to get surprises. And mm. like, that's fantastic to be able to understand the expectation of an appointment of your entire pregnancy journey even. And mm-hmm. that's, I think, part of what I try to provide is this, hey, here's what should happen at a first visit. Here's when you should get this ultrasound. Here are the questions to ask. Mm-hmm. Let's talk about it. So it is so clear that you feel comfortable in that space. I completely agree. Right? Yeah, 100%. Awesome. I love it. it. It's it's definitely personalized care. I, I hope that a lot of people end up, you know, understanding that they can call you. Yeah. You know, and that there are more resources available to them than what just the current system allows in the U.S. Right, right. Because that advanced education allows for a much healthier pregnancy and hopefully a much healthier baby. Yeah. That's what you're looking for. That's the whole so, goal. Yeah, yeah. Love it. Well, today what we've been trying to do across the board are three pillars that I have here that I always kind of bring full circle at the end here is expanding your knowledge. So we have done that well today. I think we've learned, I've learned too, a ton of the terms surrounding physical therapy and information surrounding physical therapy, particularly as it pertains to a pregnant individual. So I'm so fascinated about learning all that myself and hopefully sharing some of that knowledge with you all that are watching and listening. Second, developing skills. We have talked about resources that we're going to leave below for you, how to ask some of the questions. You have information and links to the 13 questions to ask your OB provider, and that's below, but you can find it at drlexihill.com backslash advocate. So we're working on that, and we've developed tons of those skills today. Third, and I think the biggest reason why I do this, why Amber does what she does, why most providers do what they do is to have the impact on other people's lives. And part of that impact that I'm expanding on is being able to do consults directly with individuals. You can find that on the links below as well. Go to the website anytime to get information. Go to the YouTube channel to get stories and information on different topics surrounding pregnancy anytime. That's where you're going to find a ton of the information is on the YouTube channel. And I always finish all of my interviews with individuals trying to circle back with impact because I think it's a word we use and throw around a lot. And we say, that impacted me. And then it's like, well, how did it impact you? Or what was the impact that it had upon you? And I just want to open it up to like, is there anything else you want to share with people on the impact that you feel physical therapy can have or that they can have on their own pregnancies with regard to asking the questions, particularly as it pertains to them and their pregnancy and physical therapy? Yeah, I think one of the best benefits is just that People should know that moving and exercising is healthy for them. And if they feel like it's not, that actually might be, or they're having pain. Those are the times to say, okay, I need guidance here. And a physical therapist is appropriate to do that with. Now, if you're having pain, that's usually the most obvious reason why you're going to see a doctor in the first place. But also if you're just like, you're terrified of exercising, that might be an appropriate thing to do is to just go in and get a few sessions so that you can understand how to move your body, what's safe and uh, stop preventing yourself from having a healthy pregnancy by being overly sedentary. Um, And so I think that that would be one of the biggest impacts that I hope that this has. And then also so that you understand how to access PT care, whether you're pregnant or not. Uh, And then then really the the true impact for that is your own body for post-pregnancy. So how can I impact that? Whether or not I knew I can do uh, exercise that's healthy for me before, during, and after. And there's standards for that that are really straightforward, actually. So yeah, I hope that that's, I hope that that's straightforward yeah. enough and that you know that you can access it. Yeah. And having the ability to know that it's there and if someone doesn't offer it to you, ask. Yeah, ask. And, and yeah. you can get a script or you can just call a clinic and get yeah. it. And then they can call your provider 
and get a script. It should really not be difficult to get a script from your provider. If you're finding that you always have to go in, you could call and say, I would really like a script for physical therapy. I have this pain. If it's not a specialist that you're seeing like an orthopedic surgeon, they probably are really likely to give you that because yeah. they may not even know the appropriate way to evaluate for that. Just saying. Um, and, and that's okay. So um, yeah, ask for the script if you if your state requires one and go in and you can check to see if your state has direct access. And if it does, then you can go straight into a PT clinic for an evaluation as well. And you can call ahead. If you want your insurance to cover it, they may help you get a script from your physician. Can you tell us again the the organization that helps you find a physical therapist for Oh yeah, people? the APTA is just our governing American Physical Therapy Association. Ask and advocate. Yes. I mean, that's that's all we can kind of continue to reiterate here is to do it as best you can. And we're here to try to help as much as we can. Yeah, love so, it. Give me a call you. too if you have any questions. Yes. I'm happy to refer out if that's what's necessary. Yeah, I love it. Amber, thank you again for joining me today. I really so appreciate fun. it. Thanks so much. And don't forget, as always, if you have any questions or comments, please leave them below. Anything you want to hear about in the future, I'm always happy to address that. And again, thank you so, so much to Amber for coming in today. As always, I am Dr. Lexi wishing you a happy and healthy pregnancy.